war. Huh, good God, y'all, what is it good for? Strictly limited purposes consistent with you said bellum. All right, uh, let's talk about war. This is, um, this is a really big topic. This is, in a sense, my, to the extent that I'm an expert on anything, my special area of expertise in ethics. Um, and I can, I could, and in fact do, teach an entire class on this. So we're not going to be able to get to everything that you might want to talk about here, uh, even given the relatively extensive readings. We're especially not going to be able to get to everything if my cat insists on annoying me throughout the entire time I'm recording this lecture. Um, war is, of course, uh, a huge policy issue. Um, it's almost redundant to say why, basically. Sometimes it strikes a lot of people as a necessary thing to do, but inevitably it involves death and destruction on a massive scale. So it is, in principle, it seems only justifiable for some great and overwhelming good that could balance that. And trying to find the right balance and trying to understand what kind of balance there could be is the central question of all ethical and moral reflection on warfare. So, there's really um, three kinds of, I say extreme advisedly, there are three kinds of maybe edge case uh, approaches to the ethics or the morality of war. And part of the reason I mention these up front is that these are largely not going to be the focus of our discussion, because to some extent they all provide easy and at least easy in the sense of straightforward answers to almost all questions about war, and they do this by eliminating the moral tension between the destructiveness of war and the goods that many people think can be achieved through war. So, first, obviously, uh, pacifism just the view that war is always and everywhere and evil and can never be justified. Uh, there are, of course, many varieties of pacifism. Uh, we can talk about some of them if you want. There are some people who are what you might think of as kind of principled pacifists. These would be folks who believe that uh, taking life in warfare, possibly taking life at all, is simply unjustified, period. It doesn't matter what goal could be achieved. Um, it doesn't matter what's at stake, uh, but it's just wrong to take life. There are some, for instance, Christian pacifists uh, who tend to fall into this mold. Uh, Gandhi may have been a pacifist of this type. Gandhi has some very interesting and nuanced things to say in it, so be careful saying that he just thinks it's always and everywhere unjustified. Um, there may also be what you might think of as sort of contingent or practical pa pragmatists. These would be folks who say, well, in principle, it's possible that there could be some sort of justification for war, but in the real world, the destructiveness of war is so great and the achievement of good through war is so uncertain that it is monumentally, it's not just that any actual particular war uh, is might be unjustified, but this would be, what would make this a kind of pa pacifism would be the view that it is monumentally morally implausible that there could ever be a situation where war would be would be justified. I want to say, I'm always tempted to say in the middle when there's three things, but think of this more as a, as a triangle. Then there's what you might call realism. This is to be read as realist in the sense of political realism. Um, Realists about war basically want to say that trying to apply morality to war is simply misguided. There is no morality of war. There's a prudence of war. Most realists tend to want to avoid war. Uh, war is typically a negative sum game uh, for everyone involved. It destroys the overall values when you want to avoid it. But the only meaningful considerations for the realists about initiating and conducting war are those of prudence and national interest. Moral considerations might be what you feed the public, they might be what you feed the international lawyers, but fundamentally war is just about the prudential pursuit of interest and there is no overarching morality. Um, there's a lot that could be said about 
the, the morality of the seemingly amoral realist position. For a lot of folks, realism about war in particular flows from a kind of Hobbesian picture of the international order. In a, in a very, very brief nutshell, um, for Hobbes, justice and morality really only apply within the bounds of a social contract that has an authoritative enforcer to keep it in play. So given that there is no international social contract, at least not an enforceable one, there's no international sovereign, there's no international justice, and hence only considerations of prudence rule the day. I feel I need to bracket this, there are actually some realists who believe that individual morality can become involved. So realism is a lot more complicated than I'm making it sound like. Take this to be sort of a ideal type of the situation. You know, Morgenthau, for instance, believed that morality could play a role even though law didn't. Um, so there can be some nuances. And finally, you have militarism. Uh, a variety of views you might call militaristic. These are views that say, um, look, this the whole tension that I started with, that you know, war is very, very bad, but maybe you need to do it sometimes to achieve very important ends. This is misguided. War is not bad. War is awesome. War is good. We we would have war. We should have wars even if we didn't absolutely need to have them. Um, so you know, it's war is the flowering of manhood or um, war is the health of the nation, or, that, or you know, the health of the society, the virility of... It. Historically, I have to say, often tied up with sort of masculinist metaphors, but, you know, this kind of view that war is a positive good, war is something we should desire, not something we should avoid. Um, this view, at least in sort of the kinds of circles that you are likely to run in, is not terribly in favor anymore. You know, even fairly hawkish policy types tend not to talk about war as desirable in itself. Right? So, you know, George W. Bush, who initiated for what he seemed to think were, were, were good reasons, a lot of people agreed with him, wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq, for whatever criticisms there were of him, and I don't know what the guy thinks, you know, quietly in, in, in the, the, the dark night of the soul at home, but his public rhetoric was always very much, you know, I don't want to be, I'm a war president, but I don't want to be, you know, war is horrible, I hope these wars are over soon. So, naked militarism is not something you're likely to encounter. It Once upon a time, was more common in Western circles. And of course, there are sort of remnants of it. Um, there certainly is a kind of cultural trope that those of us who have not served in warfare never experience the kind of true vivid emotions uh, of warfare, the true brotherhood of, 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 of warfare. Um, there is a definite feeling that, that serving in the military is something inherently honorable and desirable and you know makes a man out of you uh, among a lot of people. And these feelings can be quite strong, even for folks who maybe not think of themselves directly as militaristic, who if you ask them point blank, hey, do you think war is awesome, we should have lots of wars, would say no. But a kind of idealization and romanticization of the military um, is, is still still has a grip on a lot of folks. Um, and some thinkers have thought that this is inevitable, uh, given that war is a place where people get to sort of challenge their mettle in a way that uh, normal people may not seem to. Um, William James himself, not quite a pacifist, but certainly very skeptical of war. He's a William James, early 20th century American philosopher. He wrote a book, um, or not a book, an essay called The Moral Equivalent of War, where he argued that essentially what we needed was um, a national disaster response core, because this was the kind of place where we could um, let people experience all of the danger and excitement and brotherhood, sisterhood 
of serving in conflict, but basically serving to, you know, save people from forest fires or avalanches or other kinds of non-conflictual adrenaline charge situations. And the reason for this was basically he said, it's human nature to want something like that. It's human nature to desire to test yourself that way. And if the only way you can test yourself that way is in violence against other human beings, people will find reasons to engage in violence. All right, so we're not going to talk a whole lot about these three positions. Mostly we're going to focus on a more moderate position. You can think of sort of something like in the middle of the triangle, probably a little bit closer to the corners of realism and of pacifism than to the militarist corner. So if you're a pacifist or a militarist or a realist, you kind of don't need to have an ethics of war. Realists deny that war is ethical. It's amoral, right? Pacifists say it's always immoral. And militarists deny that there's any tension between the badness of war and the good cause of war, because there is no badness of war. But there are two big reasons why you might think it's important to have a ethic that shapes and restrains warfare. First is to limit its destructiveness. Um, as a lot of people have, have noted through the years, war unchecked can be massively destructive. And there are reasons to want to have warlike contests between political communities that maybe don't just destroy everything. You know, you don't want to make something a desert and call it victory if you can avoid it. So you want to avoid total war um, because you might want there to be recovery after the fact. You know, whether you want to conquer the area or whether you want to make it make a country your ally or whatever, um, you. you the more destructive the war is, the harder it is to recover from war. And most people have an interest, even the the winner usually has an interest in the eventual recovery of the area um, of the loser, and certainly of their, of their own area. And the other one, this has come up recently in a lot of discussions, is that you want to avoid giving your enemy good reasons to abuse your own soldiers or other combatants. Just as a side note, I'm probably going to use soldier a lot through this. Read it as anyone who counts as a combatant for the most part, because um, it can get clunky, right? Anyway, you don't want your enemy to feel like, hey, well, we should do whatever we want because these people are not going to respect any rules for our folks. Um, so you want to limit destructiveness in the whole situation for recovery, but you probably also want to limit the damage and the kinds of damage your enemy is going to feel justified in doing for you. The other one, you know, which is the more moral one, but I think, frankly, does have a grip on a lot of people's thinking, is that a lot of folks recognize that there will be wars, that we're not going to stop them, but we want wars that st amidst which human beings can still have some dignity. Now, some folks see this as, as basically a Quixotic kind of mission. Um, Michael Walzer in Just and Unjust Wars uh, presents at one point the view that, you know, wars kill, that's all they do, right? And we shouldn't try to paint a better face on it. C.A.J. Cody, in his very fine um, morality and political violence, takes it one step further and he says, look, Walzer's wrong about that. Wars don't just kill. They maim, they mutilate, they humiliate, they degrade. Um, you know, they starve and torture. They do all, they, you know, and, and similarly, basically doesn't want to paint a nicer face on, on war than, uh, you know, than, than is necessary. But even folks like that, for the same reason you might not want to give your enemy an excuse to abuse your soldiers, giving up and just saying there is no human dignity in war, it's essentially a degrading and mutilating enterprise, is to maybe make things even worse than they otherwise would be, right? So the other person to say, look, war is already undignified enough. Let's not, let's not give up on whatever shred we can, we can save. So the core principles of this in traditional thinking about the ethics of war are first to say that soldiers have rights and they are not criminals, merely serving as a soldier in the standard understanding of, of war ethics cannot make you as cannot make you a criminal. 
even if your cause is wrong. And more fundamentally, it's to retain this idea that by default, human beings have a fundamental right not to be subjected to violence. And so anytime you subject them to violence, you need a justification for that. The default is you're not allowed to use violence against anyone. There used to be a special reason why, in this case, for this person, you get to use violence. So somewhere in the middle of this triangle is staked out a, a body of thought referred to as just war theory. Um, just war theory, the sort of mainstream of this is also reflected not just in, in ethics, but quite closely reflected in the international laws of war. So the Hague Conventions and the Geneva Conventions and, and, and such like. Now, like a lot of other moral theories, there is a tremendous amount of variation here. Um, there are <clears throat> various disputes, some of which we'll mention, within just war theory. But there is a recognizable family of theories that are referred to as just war theory. So the basic premise of just war theory is that war is not always evil, but it's not always good. War is essentially a necessary evil. It is a bad thing, but a bad thing whose creation, participation in, can be justified by sufficient good. Now, it's not really a um, it's not really a consequentialist theory in the way that can make it sound, where you sort of see did the good consequences out, outweigh the badness. Um, it's actually most of it is more principled. It's more about what are the rules that you cannot transgress. But the idea is that there are certain kinds of good that, even though they may not outweigh in a consequentialist sense, can justify the evils of war, as long as the evils of war are suitably constrained. So there are two traditional divisions in just war theory, and I'm probably murdering the Latin pronunciation, so those of you who took Latin in your, in your prep schools, please bear with me. The first is jus ad bellum, the jab. These are rules about when it is morally acceptable to initiate a war. And then there is the use in bellow, the jib. These are the rules about how you are to conduct a war once you're involved with it. Traditionally, these have been considered wholly morally separate. And in particular, the jab, the use ad bellum, has been considered the responsibility of the political leadership of a state or of a non-state entity that can go to war. We'll talk about that in a moment. Whereas the use in bellow is traditionally considered the responsibility of the individual soldiers or combatants in the war. Um, and what I mean by separable is that the mainstream understanding is that it's possible to satisfy the rules of one without satisfying the rules of the other. So you can be a completely just combatant. Uh, if I, When I talk about just combatants or just soldiers, what I mean is someone who's fighting according to all of the rules of just war, but who is fighting in an unjust war. You can also have a perfectly just war, but fight it through unjust means. So the standard philosopher's example for the, for the first one is uh, Erwin Rommel. Uh, I don't, I'm not a scholar of the Desert Fox, so uh, this may be a philosopher's uh, hagiographic hey caricature, but so Rommel, uh, for those of you who, who, who don't immediately know, he was a Nazi general, he fought primarily in North Africa, and he was noted for resisting a number of Hitler's commands. He apparently had been ordered to um, to execute some prisoners of war and refused, generally uh, known for fighting honorably on the battlefield, and a lot of people have suggested that he wasn't really on board with the whole, you know, massive genocide part of a Nazi plan. So the idea is traditional, the, the traditional just war theory, at least if that's an accurate picture of Rommel, would say Rommel is not morally responsible for anything. He hasn't done anything wrong. Merely fighting for the, an evil cause like the Nazis' cause 
does not make the individual combatant responsible for any moral evil. The flip side um, would be something like pick your favorite terrorist group, right? So without wanting to really get into any of the controversies on this right now, um, lots of people with at least some reason believe that the Palestinian cause is just that the, the, the Palestinians have a reason to engage in some kind of conflict with Israel. Many of those people still think that terrorism, the intentional targeting of, of civilian targets, is immoral. Right? So in that case, you have you know, an individual Palestinian terrorist may well be fighting for fighting a just war, but fighting it through unjust means. Now, one of the big arguments in contemporary just war theory, and we can talk about this a bit in class, I haven't given you any readings that are right on point with this, I don't think, um, is whether these things are really separable at all. Uh, there are a lot of folks, um, myself being probably the least famous among them, who really question whether or not you can separate the two, the two divisions. Um, Lastly, then, there's been some suggestions for new divisions. Uh, I'll talk about these a uh, bit more later, but I just wanted to highlight them here. Um, people have suggested that we need to add to the Just War framework with a uh, use post bellum, what you should do after a war, and a use ex bello uh, when you can end a war permissibly. All right. So, use ad bellum. Traditionally, the use, I always have to count to do this right, the use ad bellum traditionally has six uh, principles. So, in order for a war to be justified, in order for it to be morally acceptable, generally speaking, um, you are required to meet these six criteria. Uh, some of them are more straightforward than others, uh, so we'll talk about them, some of them in more detail uh, in a couple slides, but basically, in a sense, the master virtue for war is just cause. In fact, a lot of people have argued that the other criteria don't make sense if you don't have just cause. Um, just cause is basically that uh, you have a good reason for going to war, an objectively good reason for going to war. We'll talk in a moment about what kinds of things count. But just cause isn't enough. Just having a good reason for going to war doesn't mean in and of itself that the war will be justified. There could be all sorts of potential conflicts, violent conflicts, that uh, would be fought for a good reason, but would still not be just, because they would fail on something else. So, again, as we go through this, remember that you need all of these to be satisfied on the traditional framework for the war to be justified. The second is right authority. Uh, not just anyone can go to war. Me and my buddies deciding that we want to go shoot up the place, that's not a war. It can't be justified. It can't be a violent, justified violent conflict. Right intention. Just cause is an objective criterion. Right intention is subjective. So where where they differ is in what it takes to meet them. So take something like um, a <clears throat> completely fictional, uh, I'm not trying to make a direct comment on any actual conflict, right? Take something like a war where a country is actually developing uh, dangerous, illegal weapons of mass destruction, right? And let's say, for the for the sake of argument, you know that that is a good reason to go to war, right? Maybe we can we can ramp it up. They're they're developing the weapons and they're actually like moving them into position to use them, right? Uh, we'll talk in a minute about whether that would actually be a just cause. But run with it for a moment, okay? But the reason why they are attacked is that some other country wants, you know, their mineral reserves, right? This is a case where it would turn out there was objectively just cause for the conflict, but right intention would not be satisfied. The good reason for going to war is not the reason why the war was gone to. That's utterly confusing. It's really kind of a straightforward concept, but it's really, I found it really hard to articulate in a way that doesn't make at least some people go, wait, huh? So we can talk about it more. All right, if you satisfied those, then you have to satisfy proportionality. This is the only, strictly speaking, consequentialist part of the framework, or usually understood to be consequentialist, sort of. Proportionality says that the good to be achieved needs to be comparable to the destructiveness of the war. Now, there are two things that are worth noting about this 
um, because they're often sources of confusion. The first is that proportionality is always forward looking. It's not backward looking and it's not um, sort of, you don't get proportionality by kind of looking at the consequences, right? So um, take for instance, I was having a discussion with a student in my other class uh, the two, about the 2006 Israeli war in Lebanon. There are two things that, that need to be kept in mind when making assessments of proportionality. Now, this was a war that a lot of critics said was disproportionate. Um, and there may, they, they may have been right, but there are two things that were advanced that are not issues of, dis, of proportionality according to the traditional framework. The first thing is you would sometimes see people pointing out how many Lebanese members of Hezbollah were killed versus how many Israelis. People would say, oh, you couple hundred members of Hezbollah killed, like, it was something ridiculously like 12 Israelis killed, right? Um, that's not about proportionality. Looking at the numbers after the war is over doesn't tell you um, whether the war was proportional. Certainly not comparing the numbers of casualties on one side or the other, uh, because it's all about how much destruction was there compared to the good of the war, right? So you wouldn't say, let's compare 200 dead Hezbollah to 12 dead IDF, right? You would say, let's compare 212 dead people to whatever good was achieved by, by the war. That's how you would apply proportionality. It's not a side versus side kind of comparison. The other one is that it's always forward looking. So um, another part of the thing that was criticized when people said, well, look, two Israeli soldiers were captured and you go and you have a massive war in Lebanon. That can't be proportional. Again, not really. Because it's not about, you know, typically it is not it is understood that, uh, on the, at least on the traditional just war framework, re pure revenge is usually not taken to be just cause, right? So going to war because you are upset that two of your soldiers were captured would not be just cause. What you have to do is say, what's the goal of the war? If the goal of the war is to reclaim those two soldiers, right? First of all, we might have a debate about whether that's just cause. Um, but then a full-scale war would probably not be proportional because the, the good of getting two soldiers back compared to the, the destructiveness of a large war is, is not comparable. Um, if the goal, on the other hand, is the destruction of the Hezbollah network, that then looks a lot more plausibly proportionate. That would be a significant achievement um, if you think it's a good thing, uh, and if you think it, it, it satisfies just cause to do that, it's a significant kind of thing that might justify a larger war. And the last thing to note about proportionality is that most just war theorists don't treat this as a strict numbers game. They're not toting up lives lost versus something else and trying to compare them the way that uh, a straightforward utilitarian probably would. The notion is usually more one of comparability. Um, roughly speaking, are things of the same magnitude. And the usual way that it is invoked is actually only in the breach. Uh, you'll usually only see proportionality invoked when it's a criticism and when the destructiveness has been so great or the achievement is so small that it's hard to see it as anything but out of whack. But it's usually on that kind of intuitive level. All right. Then you get this sort of somewhat more technical notion of uh, likelihood of success. This is basically just the war shouldn't be futile. You could have a great good in mind. You could have all of the authority to do it. You could have the noblest of intentions. But you know, if you're going to lose, then you're going to lose. And there's no point in getting to the destructiveness of war just to lose. There is, again, some debate about how likely is likely success have to be. But the basic intuition is, you know, if you're going to be conquered and you have no chance of not being conquered, or no significant chance of not being conquered, then maybe what we should do is just not fight. Because why not be conquered with fewer people dead than conquered with more people dead? That's the basic kind of intuition. And finally, last resort. Uh, and this is just the idea that whatever good you're trying to achieve, you should try all reasonable means of achieving it without warfare first. And of course, that reasonable criterion is a little bit wiggly. Most people put something like it in there because, of course, there's always something you could try, 
right? We've had 100 rounds of negotiation. Maybe round 101 will be the trick, right? The question is, when have you done all that you could be expected to do to try to achieve your good through some other option besides war? All right, so let's talk a little bit more detail about some of the more difficult ones. Just cause is sort of, as I said, it's kind of the key one. Not the only one, but the key. So it's worth talking about for a little bit. The least controversial concept of just cause. The thing that's going to give you the least disagreement if you say this is this is what uh, is a good reason is national self-defense. Now, as we go through these, keep in mind that just cause is not about sort of how important your cause is. It's about it being the right kind of cause. So um, one thing that is that is often pointed out is uh, car accidents kill more people in the U.S. every year than September 11th. Nonetheless, people would, most people, I, I don't know, everyone, maybe some weird utilitarians, right? But almost no one would say it would be justified for um, a, you know, for another country to invade America and change our highway safety standards, right? It would strike people, most people as frankly just silly, even though you know, lots and lots and lots of people are, are, are killed, and we thought that, you know, September 11th was a good enough reason. So it's not about the, the magnitude of your reason, it's about it being the right kind of reason. No matter how many people are killed by bad highway safety standards, or by lack of universal health care, or by, you know, smoking, or whatever, those are not the right kinds of reason to go to war. So the least controversial reason is defending your own country. This is basically uncontroversial. Um, sort of. What's basically uncontroversial is the moral acceptability of defending your nation from an attack that is going on right now. More controversial, and we might want to talk about this in class in some more detail, because I'm going to sort of go over it quickly here, is preemptive self-defense. Preemptive self-defense is the sort of thing where you're imagining, if you imagine the individual case, right, I'm, I'm you know, I'm hauling back with my fist, and I'm throwing the punch, but it hasn't landed yet, and you're faster than me, you punch me first, even though I, I technically haven't hit you yet. That's kind of the model for preemptive self-defense. Preemptive self-defense is a little bit weird in that almost everyone agrees that it would be justified, but there's very little agreement on any case, any particular case where it's justified. The least controversial which is by no means uncontroversial, but the least controversial case that I know of is Israel in the in, in, in the 1967 war, when you know Egyptian tanks were massing towards the border. Egyptian was Egypt was making belligerent rhetoric, um, and a lot of people say it looked plausible that that you know Israel had a right to strike before any tanks actually crossed the border because the attack was imminent. Um, there are lots of folks who also don't think that's true. So the principle is pretty uncontroversial. Actual cases are quite controversial. All right. Further along the line, you get preventative defense. This is what the Bush 2002 national security strategy uh, sounded like. This is, so preventative self-defense is where you are attacking a gathering threat, not an imminent threat, but you think someone might become dangerous sometime soon not they are in the middle of attacking you, right? So to go back to the personal analogy, this is not, I'm throwing the punch and you're faster than me. This is, I've never liked you, I'm going to the gym a lot, and you figure let's, let's take this guy out before he gets strong enough to threaten me. Very, very few people think that this is justified. Uh, part of the reason, in a nutshell, is just that this would seem to justify almost unlimited attacks and in fact, often the rhetorical game is taking something that looks like preventative self-defense, attacking a gathering threat, and casting it in terms of preemptive self-defense. So this is, for instance, part of the discussion about whether or not you can attack gathering threats of nuclear weapons. Because some people say, waiting for the punch to be thrown makes a lot of moral sense if, you know, if I attack and I get in a couple of blows, well, you know, you lose some troops or, or, or whatever, but it, it's something you can recover from. 
if my first blow will be New York City is a radioactive wasteland, then you know maybe we need to expand things morally. <coughs> and the other part of this is whether or not defense can extend your remit to the extent of disarming or neutralizing a threat rather than just stopping the immediate attack. And this is something we'll talk about a little bit more in terms of USEX Bellow. All right, slightly more controversial, defense of others. Um, generally speaking, it is fairly well uncontroversial that you're morally and legally allowed to uh, come to the defense of another nation, especially if it requests your help. You know, NATO is not considered immoral or illegal. This is something that can be abused. Um, there are lots of cases where where it seems at least dicey. Um, things like the transitional federal government of Somalia claiming that it invited uh, Ethiopian assistance in putting down uh, the Islamic Courts Union when uh, pretty soon before that I was at a hearing with Jendaya Frazier, then uh, Undersecretary for African Affairs, where she said, well, the transitional federal government con controls most of the town of Baidoa. Um, so again, uh, often understood as something you're allowed to ask for, can often be abused and can be controversial. We can talk about some of the issues. More controversial, uh, though gaining wide acceptance in some circles at least, is the idea that you that that protection of human rights abroad. So, defense of others in this context is usually understood as defense of other states. This would be defense of other individuals, often against their territorial state. Humanitarian intervention, responsibility to protect, causes lots of tension with the idea of sovereignty. Probably is not something I'm going to be able to get into fruitfully in this lecture. If you guys are really interested in this, we should talk about it in class. But the general idea uh, is that somehow there is a right or even a responsibility of third party states to intervene militarily to end certain kinds of at least gross human rights abuses. So, responsibility to protect, uh, which is the rubric under which this runs in uh, DC these days, um, is. Uh, you know, limited to genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. So the idea is not that every human right, someone violates the, you know, right to assembly, you automatically go and, and go in with guns blazing. And of course, this has been getting some play recently. Uh, Libya was justified explicitly on our on responsibility to protect rounds. Two, well, two kinds of, of justifications that are, are controversial to the point of being very minority views, uh, certainly now that they are acceptable. One is reprisal, punishment for past wrong, vengeance. Uh, back in the day, this was understood to be a little bit more acceptable. Nowadays, you won't see people justifying war in these terms. And the other one is um, democracy promotion, self-determination, uh, national liberation. If you're liberating yourself, a lot of people think that's fine. Promoting democracy abroad, uh, you know, the old Reagan doctrine, or promoting communism abroad, the old Khrushchev doctrine, very few people will be wholeheartedly behind this as a just cause in itself. Lots of people say that it's, it's good if you can do it, but um, you'll find relatively few defenders nowadays of the view that, on its own, creating democracy where there is no democracy could justify going to war. Most people believe that there is a right to democracy would say that uh, absent other considerations, typically uh, this is the sort of thing that you, you need to promote through other means. All right, right authority. So again, this can be a little bit complicated. Traditionally, right authority means states. States go to war. Nobody else can go to war. Aquinas says princes, princes only, sovereigns. Uh, in the real world now, there's at least two uh, caveats to that. Lots of folks think that at least certain kinds of sub-state actors can be right authorities for going to war. Not everyone does, but lots of folks think this. It can't be just me and my buddies, and there's some fuzziness about who can do this, but um, some plausible candidates are that people have said can, can be parties to a war are um, secessionist movements, 
so the IRA, uh, the Basques, um, oh man, I can't remember their name, you know, in, in Spain, the LTTE in uh, Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka, you know, whatever. These, the, you know, they may not be fighting for a just cause, right? They may fail on other things, but that they're the right kind of thing to go to war. Uh, liberation, anti-colonial movements, also a lot of people have thought. And some folks have thought that, that other kinds of ideological groups, so Al-Qaeda being one of the big ones, can be parties to a war. You know, in fact, the current war on terror is a little bit ambiguous on this, right? On the one hand, we do literally treat it like a war with Al-Qaeda when, for instance, we assert, when we take action on the territory of other states, we assert that we're not at war with the state we're at war with the organization. So we sort of treat them like a party to war, sort of. Uh, but then we also treat them not like a party to war, sort of. Uh, when, for instance, we declare all of their combatants to be illegal, irregular combatants. They can't be soldiers. They can't be protected by the rules for soldiers. Um, what makes them a little bit weird is that even for the sub-state groups, traditionally what people have let in are sub-state groups that have state-like properties. Uh, in particular, two of the one, big ones that come up are that they're organized enough that they, can Im that they can enforce the rules of war on their own combatants, and often that they have some kind of territorial control, de facto territorial control. And groups like Al-Qaeda may violate one or both of those. Um, you know, Al-Qaeda doesn't have a defined territory, unlike a state. And given its structure, it may not even have much of an ability, even if it cared to, to enforce the rules of war on its combatants, right? The, the kind of franchising model of Al-Qaeda, where to a certain extent, it seems like if you carry out a successful terrorist attack and you say you're Al-Qaeda, they're happy to tell you that you're Al-Qaeda, might break that kind of command and control that's, that's been traditionally required. The other way in which things have been pushed in the modern age is to say that maybe supra-state actors have better authority, at least for some kinds of war. This has particularly come up for things like humanitarian interventions. So a lot of folks think that um, a lot of folks who are friendly to concepts like the responsibility to protect are unfriendly to individual nations deciding, hey, human rights abuses, let's go end them with guns. But think that this is something that, for instance, the UN Security Council definitely ought to be doing. So, uh, you know, in, in a sense, the idea would be that if the United States says, let's go into Darfur and blow stuff up, uh, that even if it's, you know, it's there, we're doing it because we hate genocide and there is a genocide and we can succeed and all the other good stuff, we might not be the right kind of actor to declare to do that. Um, so it's popular to reserve this to the UN, specifically the Security Council. Um, other folks think that, <coughs> pardon me, regional organizations like NATO have um, some degree of moral authority, at least. <coughs> pardon me. So if NATO decides there's some horrible human rights abuse going on, at least sort of within NATO's sphere of influence, uh, you know, maybe that is the right kind of authority, even if the Security Council doesn't sign off. Kosovo, controversial discussion of this. Um, fewer people are willing to buy that coalitions of the willing, so coalitions that come up around one particular case are can be right authorities, at least if you need anything more than individual states. But even coalitions of the willing can, at least if they're not sort of nakedly manipulated, can give some indication that it's not just one state's idiosyncratic view that there's something important going on. Um, so yeah, so the other kind of consideration might be that maybe we should consider at least certain kinds of war to be authorizable only by supra-state organizations. Now, of course, there are also plenty of people who think this is bourgeois. Um, there, the original responsibility to protect document said that this is an international obligation. The Security Council doesn't act, regional organizations don't act, individual states might have to act. Very moral, realist view, um, but basically saying it could be that, you know, only Belgium is willing to do right. Uh, and, if, and if it's the right thing, then Belgium should do it. <coughs> Certainly for things other than humanitarian intervention, 
there are few friends of the idea, for instance, that immediate national self-defense is something that needs to be authorized by anyone besides the individual state. So, yeah, something to consider. All right, let's talk about use in Bellow. These are the rules about how you conduct the war once you're there. Use ad bellum has two two rules. As uh, use ad bellum has six rules, rather you're supposed to follow. Use in bellow has only two. Uh, the first is uh, discrimination or distinction. I, I've seen both words used. I usually use discrimination. This is the rule that says innocence may not be intentionally targeted. And I put innocence in quotes because who is an innocent is a difficult question. It is intended to mean innocent of involvement of the war, not necessarily morally innocent, but, but not involved with the war in some meaningful way. And one big corollary of this is that in, essentially indiscriminate weapons are usually taken to be either banned or morally banned or severely restricted, right? So this is often what seems to be wrong with nuclear weapons, for instance. You can't aim your nuclear weapon only at troops. Maybe, all right, there might be some weird cases where you can, but generally speaking, right? Um, and so the idea would be that the, the weapon itself is gone because it's impossible to use it in accord with the rules of war. The other rule for use in bellow is a use in bellow version of proportionality. So the same way that proportionality for jab means that the overall destructiveness of the war needs to be comparable with the overall good to be achieved from the war. Proportionality for the jib means that the destructiveness of any individual act in the war needs to be comparable to the military advantage to be gained from that act. And everything else is the same. It's forward-looking, yada, yada, yada. Um, and this is often taken to ban or restrict the use of weapons that maim or cause undue suffering, which is considered to be, to be sort of always disproportionate. You may have a legitimate interest in taking out your enemy's soldiers, but you don't have a legitimate interest in giving them respiratory problems for life. Uh, so, you know, the idea is that you're required to take the, for lack of a better word, cleanest approach to killing the enemy that you can. So, sometimes things happen. Of course, many people are maimed and mutilated in war, even using regular old bullets. But weapons like mustard gas certain kinds of biological agents that uh, poison is often considered in this category uh, that are debilitating or humiliating or mutilating are often considered off limits. Okay. So, discrimination. The first question for discrimination, of course, is who are the innocents or who are the non-combatants? Um, there are certain kinds of paradigm cases that are pretty easy. Someone who is in uniform shooting at you right now. Paradigm combatant. Someone who is a, you know, infant. Civilian infant. I don't know if you have a non-civilian infant. Right? Someone who's an infant. Paradigm non-combatant. In the middle, things can get a little bit mushy. And there's a number of categories of folks who are, who are a little bit mushy. Um, first is, what about civilians in support roles? All sorts of civilians in support roles. Uh, everyone from, you know, the people who drive the trucks to the people who work in munitions plants, the people who grow food for the, uh, for the, for the military. This can be a little bit murky, especially in the contemporary world where there are lots of support roles that, that used to be done primarily by people in uniform that we now have outsourced to contractors, at least in, in Western militaries, uh, a lot more. So once upon a time, it might have been that all of the cooks in the mess halls were, you know, military cooks. We still have military cooks. It's not that they're gone. Now they might be Kellogg Brown Root. Hey, if you're in the green zone in Baghdad, I haven't been to the green zone, but knowing people have, right? They might be like Pizza Hut employees. Someone, they're, they're civilians, right? They're not, you're not, unif well, you're not in a military uniform, right? So, if, you know, the, the, the quick rule of thumb is sort of anyone in uniform you're allowed to target. The question then becomes, well, what about the, if you were allowed to target military cooks, why can't you target the Pizza Hut guys? Uh, and if you're not allowed to target the Pizza Hut guys, do we have to say military cooks and mechanics and what are off limits? So, doing more things with people out of uniform 
sort of hi it doesn't create, but it highlights some of the murkiness of this category. One traditional way of dividing, I think this is the way Walzer does in the piece that you've you've read, so the way Nagel does in War and Massacre, is to make a distinction between people who support the soldiers qua soldiers and people who support them qua human beings. So if you are someone who is driving tank fuel around, you can be legitimately targeted. You are a combatant in this sense. If you are someone who grows food or prepares MREs or whatever, you are not legitimately targetable. You are not a combatant in that sense. <coughs> Pardon me. But even here, things can, can still be a little bit murky, uh, especially when you start talking about irregular forces, right? So irregular forces that get around in civilian vehicles. Um, maybe they use them also for their civilian life, right? If you are the mechanic who fixes cars that, um, you know, insurgents use to drive around in. Are you a combatant or not? Can be a tough question. Some people ask a question about political supporters, right? So take something like the US. A lot of people in the US military, they're there because they want money for college or whatever. They're not necessarily there because they believe wholeheartedly in the war. Uh, you know, I met one guy who was from Iraq veterans against the war, you might expect, didn't have a very high view of the Iraq War. You know, he would talk about sitting outside his tent and playing anti-flags, die for your government, you know, loudly over and over again, even when he was there. He joined up for economic reasons, didn't, didn't care about the war, but, you know, couldn't leave, didn't, didn't want to take the legal consequences for leaving. Um, on the other hand, you've got folks who are civilians but are totally gung-ho about the war, right? So you might ask from a moral standpoint, why is it that you can shoot these reluctant warriors? I mean, even in the U.S., we don't have conscription, right? But generally speaking, it's understood you can shoot conscripts. That's actually my next question. What about conscripts, right? People were forced to be there or were there for reasons absolutely un unrelated to the war. But, you know, you can't shoot the person who's got, you know, go war bumper stickers all over their SUV. And some people might say, well, why is that, right? Surely the the person who is enthusiastically a political supporter bears some moral responsibility for the war, maybe even more moral responsibility for the war than a conscript or someone you know who opposes the war who's part of, part of the military. And finally, there's this question, it's a little bit different about why is it okay to kill just combatants? Why is it okay to kill the people on the, on the, on the side of the angels in a war, if there is anyone? You can always have a war with two sides that are unjust. Think about, like, police, right? We don't generally think that uh, criminals have a right to attack police who are chasing them, right? We expect the criminals, we don't really expect them in the sense of predict it, but we, we morally expect the criminals to submit to police authority. So why would it be okay for, if we, if we say that one side has a just cause and the other side is fighting unjustly, right? One side is fighting in defense of the nation, the other side is fighting for naked conquest. Why is it okay to kill the just combatants? They didn't do anything wrong. Uh, you know, what makes this different from just straight up murder? All right. Another question is whether avoiding intentional targeting is enough. There are a lot of folks wrote in in his piece on terrorism without intention raises this. There are a lot of criticisms, especially of Western militaries that are have access to very, very destructive weaponry, especially in contemporary wars that have often happened in populated areas, about whether just saying, well, we didn't aim at any civilians. We knew a tremendous number of civilians were likely to be killed, um, especially if there's a sort of callous disregard for the civilians, even if your intent is not to harm them, um, whether that's enough or whether you are violating, morally violating the principle of discrimination if you are merely callous or careless about civilian lives, non-combatant lives. Another issue that's come up a lot, uh, again, not in the stuff I gave you to read, because how much can I give you to read, is the issue of uh, what's sometimes called dual-use infrastructure. So the question about when and where can you target, say, the electricity grid that runs the radar system, but also the civilian water filtration plants. All right, proportionality. Proportionality is um, often traditionally governed by what's called the doctrine of double effect. Um, this is a very odd sort of thing where the, the main places I see this applied are in uh, questions about bombing and questions about abortion. 
uh, and it actually comes from Catholic theological ethics, uh, where is where it has its original home. I think with the Jesuits. Jesuits are good at wiggling out of things. So anyway, doctrine of double effect is a way of trying to explain when it is acceptable to do something that you know will harm non-combatants. Remember, the principle of discrimination only says you can't target non-combatants. If you believed it was always immoral to do anything that you believed would harm non-combatants as a side effect, you could never have a war. Non-combatants are always harmed in war. No matter how you define them, no matter how careful you are, non-combatants are always harmed. Pacifists are, are saying, yeah. Just worth here is saying, oh, this is why we need a reason. We need, we need a principle. So the doctrine of double effect, the reason it's called double effect is that it focuses on actions that have two outcomes. One outcome is whatever legitimate military aim you have. And the other outcome is the deaths of non-combatants or harm to non-combatants. And what it trades on generally is that there's plenty of times that we do things with foreseeable consequences, but that it makes sense to say that we don't intend. So uh, one example that, that always made sense to me is I go out for a jog, something I should do more often, right? I intend to get some exercise, lose some weight, burn some calories. I know that this will wear down the tread on my sneakers. It's not like I'll wear down the tread on my sneakers by accident, but nonetheless, it would make it would be a little bit weird to say I intend to wear down the tread on my sneakers. It's merely a foreseen side effect. It's one that I don't intend. And one um, fairly plausible way of trying to, to, to like parse this out is to think about what effects, <coughs> if they didn't happen, would you need to ensure that they happened um, to achieve your goal? Versus what things would you stop if you could? Right? I want to burn calories when I go jogging. I don't really want to wear down the tread of my sneakers. If I could get magical sneakers that didn't wear down their treads, that'd be awesome. Uh, similar thing for warfare, right? So standard kind of philosopher's example is, you know, you're, you're bombing a military base in a populated area, you're using the lowest yield bomb that you can that will actually destroy the target, but you know that instead of populated populated area, so some some non-combatants who live near the military base are, will be killed. Uh, if you could, you would blow up just the military base and not the combat and not the non-combatants, right? Some by some miracle stroke of luck, no non-combatants were killed. You wouldn't fly back over and bomb them again to make sure they were killed. That would be something that would be plausibly permissible by double effect. Bombing civilians to demoralize the enemy would not be, right? Even if you say, well, my aim is to demoralize the enemy, not to kill the civilians. Killing civilians is a mean, it's not an effect of demoralizing the enemy, it's a means to doing it. If you missed all the civilians in your first bombing run, you'd have to go back around and bomb them again. That would be impermissible. So the rule is you can't aim at non-combatant deaths and but you can foresee them as long as the aim is not to, to cause them. You can know they're going to happen. Again, pacifists are saying, are calling BS from the back of the room, but that's the standard, standard way of doing it. Uh, and also that however many civilian deaths there are going to be or are likely to be, that has to be in some way comparable to the good you're going to be achieved. So you can't bomb some irrelevant military target and kill hundreds of civilians, even if you merely foresee them, you don't, um, you, you don't intend them. The other question is whether proportionality can apply to combatants, right? Do you have any, any obligation to kill as few combatants as possible or to make sure that at least it's comparable uh, in conducting the war? I mentioned before, it may at least for the purposes of barring, maiming, or mutilating weapons, but there are other cases that people have claimed. So, um, for instance, uh, attacks on the retreating Iraqi columns uh, towards the end of the first Gulf War were sometimes criticized for being essentially disproportionate. There was no military advantage to be gained from doing it. They were already retreating and there's no reason that you needed to kill those soldiers. So even though they were combatants, it may have been disproportionate to attack them, some claimed. A lot of folks think that essentially, say you have a pass, you can kill as many combatants as you want. They're a special category they've sort of agreed to be killed or, or whatever. Okay. What about military necessity? 
So here's where we might just throw all of the last, uh, probably some unholy amount of time out the window. Uh, this is the last lecture you're going to have to listen to at least, even if it's long. So the real question is, are these rules absolute or can they ever be suspended? And a lot of people have said that in extremis, you are allowed to violate these rules. The most common claim is that if your nation is facing a true existential threat, the nation is likely to be destroyed if it loses this war. Uh, then since no one could reasonably expect a nation to fight fair in those circumstances, we can't really place any moral limits on it. Right, so the idea is sort of you can't morally require someone to do something that no reasonable person would ever do. This is quite plausible to folks like Walzer, who understand the nation as something like an individual. Right, a lot of us think that, not everyone, but a lot of us think that we'd be justified in breaking lots of moral rules in order to preserve our own life, if it was truly the only way. Other folks say one of two things. They either say, look, even in the individual case, this is not plausible, right? Um, if I, for some reason, uh, don't make me think of the example right now, right? But if I, for some reason, could only save my own life by murdering an innocent baby, you know, maybe, I don't know, I hope I'm never in that position. Maybe I wouldn't have the guts to, 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 to do it, but... Um, you know, like people say, it would just it would still be immoral, right? If that's somehow the awful case you end up in, you just ought to die. Other people say, well, maybe you can justify a lot, if not everything, in the individual case, but nations are not individuals. They don't have the same kinds of rights to preserve themselves that individuals do. Um, but, yeah, this is the standard kind of question. Is, are there, is there a kind of military necessity that could justify violation of the rules of war? Legally speaking, there's been a move to say, no, there are some things that military necessity cannot trump. So the Convention Against Torture specifically says that military necessity is, does not justify waiving your obligations under the Convention Against Torture. On the other hand, lots of folks um, don't agree. Uh, William Ju Justice Rehnquist um, famously wrote a book called All the Laws About One, about habeas corpus, you know, arguing that if there truly was an existential threat to the nation, uh, you would not want to see the entire nation destroyed to uphold one law. Uh, this is certainly consonant with the thinking of a lot of people about, about the war on terror, that um, there are some threats that have manifested through this war that are so grave, so dire, the ticking time bomb scenarios, that, you know, torturing people, attacking non-combatants, these sorts of things could be could be justified. Certainly on the other side, right, this is basically the calculation that, that every terrorist makes, um, is that there's some necessity that trumps the normal ban on targeting non-combatants. Um, other kinds of corollary questions. It used to be more generally accepted that you could engage in reprisals, as a kind of deterrent for violating the laws of war. If your enemy murders some civilians, you can murder some of their civilians. Uh, this is deprecated. Please do not try this. Uh, you probably will not get away with it now. But there are some folks who argue that this is this is morally justified. The current legal regime may not accept it, but that, that would be a morally justified thing to do. And there are a lot of folks um, who have suggested that the traditional rules of war might unfairly favor militarily powerful states. This is a version of the uh, both the rich and poor can, are forbidden from sleeping under bridges kinds of, kinds of rule. So this is in fact the kind of argument that a lot of, that is also made by groups that use terroristic uh, practices to, uh, to advance their cause, that they don't have access to the kinds of heavy weaponry that uh, a country like the U.S. has, and that there's a kind of moral. This is often tied to a charge of a kind of moral hypocrisy, right? Where they'll say, "Look, you know, you drop 500-pound bombs <coughs> that you know will kill dozens of civilians, sometimes hundreds of civilians, um, 
uh, to get some military target. But you say, oh, well, we were, we were not directly targeting the civilians, so it's okay when we do it. But, you know, a terrorist blows him or, so, him or herself up and kills a handful of civilians, and suddenly, you know, they're a horrible, evil person who needs to be wiped off the face of the earth. Uh, so, you know, some people, uh, this, this criterion of intent, especially when the, when it is at least plausible to make charges of callousness or carelessness against militarily powerful nations in their handling of civilian deaths, is uh, one that, that, that people have made, um, and, and a lot of people take to justify terroristic tactics or deceptive tactics or insurgent tactics uh, because to sort of even the playing field. All right. As I mentioned before, there are some suggestions. I'm going to go through this really quickly for new divisions of just war. Uh, one is that maybe we need a separate set of rules for use ex bello. These are rules for when you should end a war. Uh, if there is a traditional view on this, it's pretty much that you end the war whenever the, the cause has been achieved. But for instance, one of the questions that arises uh, for some writers who've talked about this is, could you ever continue a war to achieve an aim that would not have constituted just cause for the war in the first place? So McMahon worries about, for instance, um, eliminating some country's military capacity on its own would not constitute just cause, he thinks. Most people think, right? Um, but if you are already engaged in repelling conquest by that country. Could you continue the war, even after the conquest is repelled, to go on and dismantle their military capacity? Uh, you know, or do you have to stop once the, the conquest is done? What about promoting democracy? Right? Most people don't think that promoting democracy on its own could justify a war. But if you're already at war for some other good reason, uh, would it be permissible to continue the war until you achieve a democratic state? These are some of the questions that come up. The other one is use postbellum. These are rules for conduct of post-war operations. So peacekeeping, occupation, uh, counterinsurgency sort of straddles the line between war and post-war. Um, but a lot of people think that there might be special rules for this that are neither the rules of war nor just sort of peacetime political morality rules, because you do often have military engagements going on, even though the war itself is over. Uh, and there are really two big tensions that people worry about here that might shape specialized moral concerns. One is the tension between getting it right and getting out. Most people believe that there's a, at least prima facie, right to self-determination that everyone has, and that generally speaking means that countries should be allowed to rule themselves. You might think there are lots of exceptions, but generally speaking, people think by default nations have a right to rule themselves. As we have seen in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and also in every UN peacekeeping mission ever, there can be a tension between staying long enough to completely reconstruct a place that's been quite damaged um, and the, the fact that you might be undermining reconstruction by being there um, versus, you know, letting people run, run it themselves, right? And striking that balance between when do we leave a situation that is not perfect but good enough that we should let them work out any further kinks on their own is one question that comes up. And the other tension might be the interest of the third party very often for post for, for post conflict situations, you're talking about a third party uh, intervention, and the interests of the locals, right? So when the U.S. is think this is one of the things that came up with the debate about whether or not we should use a counterterrorism model or a counterinsurgency model in Afghanistan. Presumably, the interest of the local Afghans is a stable, peaceful country. The interest of the U.S. though might be they're not being a threat of terrorist attacks from the country. These interests might be, to some extent, harmonizable, but chances are they probably also diverge a bit. And so there are moral questions about, if the U.S. is there, do they have an obligation to, you know, how much are, they, are, how much are we allowed to promote our own interests, uh, especially given that we're promoting them sort of in the territory of the Afghans? And we're prom promoting them under the rubric of being there for the benefit of the Afghans, right? Are we allowed that kind of moral tension, and, and to what extent? You know, no one thinks that we're there 
purely because we love justice. We might love justice, right? But it's not the only reason we're there. And the question is, which which set of interests can and should be allowed to dominate? All right. To come back to the pacifists, or at least the pacifist fellow travelers, a little bit, you might want to step back and get a little bit bigger picture view of war. Uh, call it the war machine to be a little bit provocative, but this is the, just the general idea is that we might want to ask from a moral standpoint, not just these sort of just war questions about how do we assess this individual war, but questions about the institution of warfare itself. What social and political role does warfare play? Why do we have it? Especially given how bad it seems to be for a lot of folks involved. There are very few wars that even in retrospect we look at and go, wow, I'm glad that war happened, right? Even the ones that we think maybe were necessary tend to be tragic. So why are we doing this? One question that a lot of people raise is, is whether or not war, essentially the institution of it, not any individual war, but the institution of warfare and the military reinforces bad social relationships, right? This is similar to questions you raised about the police. To some extent, police preserve the status quo. So if the status quo is bad, that might be a bad thing for the police institution. <clears throat> a lot of people have accused warfare of reinforcing um, bad social hierarchies. Sexism, racism, uh, imperialism, obviously. Uh, and, you know, they have some reasons behind it. Um, you know, Martin Luther King, in his... Uh, not quite as famous as I Have a Dream, but a uh, fairly famous speech. This is basically his criticism, is that spending money on war, devoting resources to war, essentially reinforces poverty and, to some, and, 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 and racism in, in the country. Um, more clearly poverty is sort of the more direct effect. Uh, we need a longer conversation about, about the race issue. Um, other folks... Cynthia Enlow has made a career, essentially, of arguing that, that systems of warfare reinforce sexist structures that essentially, um, this is glossing over a huge amount of work very briefly, but essentially that um, the rigidly defined gender roles that we have in society in modern society are, to a large extent, created and sustained so as to sustain warfare. Um, and warfare, in turn, reinforces them. Connected to this pretty closely uh, is the, the idea that war inevitably will benefit only a portion of the state's population. This is why traditional Marxists were uh, always um, against war, except for, you know, that would say, no war but class war. The idea was that traditional war benefits only the elites, modern parlance, the 1%, probably like the 5%. Uh, whereas for working people, war was was necessarily inherently bad. And the idea was that, who cares? Um, especially for the Marxists, the version of this was, who cares which capitalist bourgeoisie controls you? Right? That's not an issue that's of interest to the working class. And a lot of people, um, you know, you don't have to be a Marxist to see the sentiment expressed. You'll see a lot of people talking about how, well, in an insurgent area in Iraq, right, um, you know, there are some folks who are really invested in throwing at the Americans. The Americans are really invested in getting control of the situation. The average person just wants to be left alone. The average person doesn't see much difference between whether the, you know, which party is in charge or whether the Americans stay or the Americans leave. Um, they want the violence to end so they can get on with their lives. Again, a related kind of question would be whether war could be beneficial to the state but not the people in it. Uh, Walzer, for instance, in work, besides the stuff that I've, I've given you, is fairly willing to buy this and say it's even a good thing. Um, other folks might see it as less good. Uh, David Roden has written a book called War and Self-Defense that talks a lot about this, about the idea that war to preserve the state might preserve the state at the expense of great hardship for the people in the state. And so you might ask, especially, this might be sort of an inevitable aspect of war, is that it privileges the state over the individual. So why Hobbes had a huge problem with warfare, actually. You know, Hobbes' whole system was based on the premise that the fundamental justification for doing anything is self-preservation, individual self-preservation. And this raises a real problem for him, but what do you say about soldiers? 
who seemed to be fighting for the state, not for themselves. And he had a complicated answer to that. And finally, um, from this sort of higher level view, you might ask, well, what, what are, why are we willing to go to war for and only for the things that we're willing to go to war for? Um, and this is really the question McKinnon is asking in her piece, uh, Women September 11th. I think it's really easy to read that piece as a kind of satire, right? To read it as if what she's saying is, by the logic that uh, we used to go to war for, you know, go to war for an abstract goal against a non-state entity with limited central organization after September 11th, well, heck, you could use that same logic to go to war against domestic violence. Ha ha ha, isn't that silly? I don't think that's actually her point. I don't think she's trying to do a kind of satirical reductio here. I think McKinnon is quite serious. I think McKinnon, um, not a pacifist, I think McKinnon actually would welcome in some situations using military or at least paramilitary tactics against, you know, domestic violence, right? Um, the same way that we surveil mosques, and a lot of people think it's, a lot of people don't think it's justified, a lot of people do think it's justified, right? But we surveil mosques that um, we worry are spouting uh, militant rhetoric. We, you know, I think McKinnon would say we should surveil churches that are spouting sexist rhetoric that supports domestic violence, right? Um, the same way that we use, uh, you know, the techniques of military engagement, drone strikes, right? Wasn't as big a thing when she wrote the piece, right? To attack people who might in other situations be considered criminal, I don't think McKinnon would be upset if you you know, said anyone who is suspected of being, you know, of, of, of having killed women unjustifiably in this, in this war, uh, can be designated an enemy combatant by the president and killed without trial. I don't know that she would be that upset about that. I mean, she's enough of a lawyer. I think she may worry about procedure, but, um, I don't think she'd be upset to move in that direction. So I think she's dead serious in her suggestion. And part of what's supposed to be illuminate is the role that war plays. If we treat war as this kind of neutrally defined, ahistorical, eternal thing, we miss the fact that the way we've conducted war has changed radically, not just since September 11th, but over the centuries. Um, if you want a discussion, Martin Van, Martin Van Creveld has made his career, uh, he's a Israeli political scientist, describing sort of the changes and shifts in the nature of warfare over the centuries. So, to some extent, Euphoria McKinnon is saying, we shape what we call war to our own ends. Um, what we are willing to use military force for is not something historical. It's not just, there's this thing, war, that we've occasionally appealed to throughout history. And so you might ask, why do we have war in the shape that we have now? Why are we allowing it to evolve in this way? Should we evolve it in a different way? Should we maybe use military tactics for domestic violence? And McKinnon's throwing down the gauntlet on that. She's saying, look, if you don't think going after a not, if you don't think of going after something like terror is crazy, why do you think going after something like domestic violence is crazy? Um, what does that mean? What does that say about our society? All right. So, bringing all of these disparate threads home, you now have the turbo but still too long version of my entire class. Just War Theory tries to find some middle ground, really between pacifism and militarism. Uh, what distinguishes it from uh, realism is that it is still a normative theory. It doesn't deny the applicability of morality to warfare. There are two divisions of it, two traditional divisions. Use ad bellum, the jab, about going to war, and use in bello, the jib, about how you conduct the war once you find yourself there. And traditionally, they're considered morally separate. Not by everyone, but traditionally. Uh, there's a deep question about whether or not the rules of war, the moral rules of war, can be superseded by true military necessity. And finally, if you focus in, uh, in a laser way on the details of when war is or is not permissible, you may obscure uh, the broader social and political context in which wars are thought about and determined. Once you start asking the, arguably, once you start asking the questions of the just war framework, you're already halfway into the story and you might worry about what you've missed. Okay.